And Carol, just let me know whenever you get everyone on the line. Okay, Blake, could you let um, folks on the phone know we need just five more minutes? Yeah, sure. We've been giving standbys uh, every minute or two, just letting them know we'll be starting here in a little bit. So we'll continue doing that. I told them to go ahead and press star one if they had a question or comment, too. Okay, thank you. Sure. Just to explain to those present why we're delaying, um, the director of finance, who is a member of the statewide authority, is on his way over. And so we're giving him a chance to get here for our inaugural meeting. Okay, sure. Do you want me to let the audience know that? Uh, no, I, I think if the, for the audience on the phone, if we just tell them we'll start in a couple of minutes. Thanks. Okay, great. Can do. Blake, we're going to go ahead and get started now. We are going to now. Okay. I will transfer us in. You'll hear music for just a moment. I will turn that music off, read my introductory script, and turn the call over to you, Ms. Schwartzlander. Everyone have a great call. Thank you. Transferring us now. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the IHSS Statewide Authority Meeting. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. There will be opportunity for public comment on public agenda items. Press star, star then one if you'd like to comment during the call today. If you should require assistance during the call, please press star then zero. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Carol Schwartzlander. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. And I will now turn it over. Good afternoon. Um, for those on the phone and in the room, um, I'm Will Lightborn, the director of the California Department of Social Services. Um, and by statute, one of the five members of the In-Home Supportive Services Statewide Authority. Um, we are joined by this, this afternoon, um, Jennifer Kent, who is the director of the California Department of Healthcare Services. Um, again, a statutory appointee. Um, we're joined, we're very pleased.
pleased to welcome Mike Powers, um, who has been appointed by the governor uh, to fill one of the two seats um, for county representation on the statewide authority. Um, David Twa, um, who was also was appointed by the governor on Friday, um, is traveling today and could not be here, but will join us at future meetings. We are also expecting um, Michael Cohen, uh, the California Director of Finance, who is the third statutory member of the statewide authority. Um, just as a little bit of sort of background and, and housekeeping, um, out the doors and to the left are the uh, facilities and restrooms. We're not planning to take any breaks um, in the agenda today, so both uh, uh, attendees and uh, authority members, um, we hope you'll just feel free to um, take whatever breaks you need whenever it's convenient. Um, if I could ask the operator, how many um, uh, callers do we have on the line at this time? Currently, we have 33 on the line. Thank you, operator. Um, the meeting is also being webcast, and the webcast, as well as the materials for the meeting, are posted on the IHSS Statewide Authority website, which is www.ihssstatewideauthority.ca.gov. I'd just like to offer a, a bit of background for the um, are coming together today. This is the first uh, meeting of the IHSS Statewide Authority. The Statewide Authority um, was created as a part of the California In-Home Support Services Program. It's the largest uh, personal care program in the U.S. It serves about 490,000 people. Um, and th the, those, those people receive their services through almost 400,000 caregivers. Um, in 2012, the legislature adopted the Continuum of Care integration effort, which um, was, is, brings together Medicaid-funded and Medicare-funded services at county levels in what were then expected to be eight and are now seven counties. Um, as part of the implementation of the CCI, it was determined that when those counties had completed enrollment in what is called the, the, the full CCI program, then the bargaining agreements in the seven counties would transition to being the responsibility of a statewide authority in place of the local public authorities which have held those contracts um, heretofore. The seven demonstration counties are Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, San Diego, San Mateo, and Santa Clara. Um, the implementation schedules in the seven counties um, are on slightly different cycles, and the first of the collective bargaining agreements is transferred to the statewide authorities um, responsibility today in that the director of the Department of Healthcare Services has notified us that San Mateo County has completed transition into CCI effective February 23rd, 2015, which of course is today. The primary um, purpose of today's meeting is really to sort of establish the organizational structure of the statewide authority, consider and adopt bylaws, um, and do the sort of organizational housekeeping that is um, needed to um, make this a, 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 a consistent, reliable, um, well-run organization. Um, I've sort of introduced our uh, other two um, uh, present uh, authority members, but I would just ask um, uh, Mr. Powers and Ms. Kent if they'd like to just add anything. Sure. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Kent, Department of uh, Healthcare Services. I would like to, you know, acknowledge the good work of the staff that has brought this uh, 
authority up um, to where we are today, and I look forward to working with each of you on the authority, and then also would just like to speak um, to the importance that the program itself provides to almost 500,000 uh, beneficiaries served through Medi-Cal, and that we um, acknowledge that individuals requiring um, either special assistance, help with uh, uh, daily living skills, and or those living with disabilities in their homes, that for many um, individuals this is a critical um, service that's provided to them, in that this re allows them to um, retain both an independence and a sense of being in the community rather than being institutionalized, which of course is what um, the CCI um, endeavors to do um, for all of the individuals that are enrolled. So with that, um, I thank you for having me and look forward to this. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mike Powers, and just uh, excited to be a part of this project. As uh, Ms. Kent said, uh, in-home support uh, providers play just an absolutely vital role uh, in our healthcare community, and I'm excited to be uh, part of this program. And integration of services is is really crucial to the success of uh, of providing those services, and it's something we've worked very hard on in our county, and look forward to to working with you all on uh, at a statewide level. Um, and, and really, uh, as also uh, Ms. Kent said about the staff, look forward to working with staff from uh, Social Services, uh, Healthcare, and also the, uh, the, the Labor Team from uh, State Human Resources Department. So thank you very much. Michael? Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, apologies for being late. Uh, Michael Cohen uh, from the Department of Finance. Uh, I know that this has been a, um, a long time in the works, and uh, certainly the Coordinated Care Initiative that this is uh, – a component of has been um, a key initiative that the administration has undertaken over the last few years, and uh, we're all very excited to uh, continue this and make sure the uh, the overall uh, program is successful. So happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, we've asked um, Mark Sumner, who's a attorney with the Department of Managed Health Care, um, to serve as the authorities. Um, legal expert on issues of procedure and form, and so we'd like to introduce Mark and ask him to do a presentation for us on uh, our operating requirements and systems. There we go. Thank you, Director Lightborn. I'm going to walk through a very brief presentation about Robert's Rules of Orders and Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. I know some of this material is familiar to many of you, but for the purposes of uh, those members of the public or other interested members, uh, this might be beneficial. Uh, the meetings will be conducted uh, under Robert's Rules of Order, and as we'll see, uh, a section of the bylaws will also uh, make that reference. In general, when operating under Robert's Rules of Orders, a board or a state body, or in this case, the statewide authority, makes their decisions through motions. And after the last speaker on a topic finishes, a member may make a motion when recognized by the chair. Another member must second that motion for it to be considered. The chair will present the motion to the board or the statewide authority, at which point the person who made the motion cannot change it without majority consent. The members may discuss the motion after it's presented. The member who introduced the motion always speaks first, and then comments and debate are directed to the chair. And after discussion, the members vote. And as we'll see under the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, that vote must be public. Now moving on to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, California Public Meetings Law governing state agencies such as a statewide authority is officially called the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. I'll refer to it as the Open Meeting Act, uh, although those of us in state service usually refer to it as Bagley Keene, but uh, for these purposes today, I'll just call it the Open Meeting Act. It closely parallels the Ralph M. Brown Act, which governs meetings of local government bodies. Government Code Section 11120 declares that the state's public policy is that proceedings of public agencies be conducted openly so that the public may remain informed. And each body has essentially three duties under the Open Meeting Act. First, to give adequate notice 
of the meetings to be held, second, to provide an opportunity for public comment, and third, to conduct the meetings in open session, except where closed session is specifically authorized. A meeting is defined in the law to include any congregation of a majority of the members of the state body at the same time and place to hear, discuss, or deliberate upon any item that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the state body to which it pertains. And on the slide, there's the specific code section if you want to reference that. A body is required to give at least 10 days calendar notice, written notice, of each meeting to be held. The notice must contain the website address where the notice can be accessed, must be posted on the website at least 10 calendar days before the meeting, and must be made available in appropriate alternate formats upon request by any person with a disability. The notice of the meeting must include an agenda that's prepared for that meeting. The agenda must include all items of business to be transacted or discussed at the meeting and items not included on the agenda may not be discussed, even if no action is to be taken by the body. However, a common way for members of the public and members of the body to raise issues that were not on the agenda is to include an agenda item titled Agenda Items for Future Meetings, and this allows members of the public or members of the body an opportunity to request that specific agenda items be placed on a future meeting. The proposed items should not be discussed substantively, but only to the extent necessary to determine whether they should be included as an agenda item in a future meeting. And when the members vote, they must vote in public. They can't vote uh, by secret ballot. A tape or film record made by the body must be made available for public inspection under the California Public Records Act but may be erased or destroyed 30 days after that taping or recording. Regarding public attendance, a member of the public is not required to register or sign in to attend a public meeting. A person who wishes to make a public comment may be asked to identify himself or herself for the body's records or minutes. And all meetings must be accessible to the disabled. Regarding public comment at meetings, members of the public have an opportunity to directly address the state body on each agenda item before or during the body's discussion or consideration of the item. But the opportunity for comment need not be made available if the agenda item is one that may be properly considered in closed session, which includes pending litigation, or if there are other exemptions to the Open Meeting Act. And I'll give a couple examples of those exemptions uh, following the next slide. A body may establish a standing rule that discussion of agenda items will be given a specific amount of time or that public comment will be limited to a certain amount of time by adopting an administrative regulation such as bylaws, and we'll be discussing the bylaws later in the meeting. Uh, some exemptions from the Open Meeting Act for this specific statewide authority were put into California law, and that statute can be found at Government Code 110034.5. And the following proceedings will be exempt from the Open Meeting Act. The first is any meeting negotiation or discussion between the statewide authority or its designated representative, and a recognized or certified employee organization. The second exemption is any meeting of a mediator with either party or both parties regarding the meeting and negotiation process that I just described. The third exemption is any hearing, meeting, or investigation conducted by a fact finder or arbitrator in connection with those meetings I described above. And the fourth exemption, and excuse me, this is a little bit of, of a mouthful, but any executive session of the statewide authority or between the authority and its designated representative, including but not limited to the Department of Human Resources, for the purpose of, dis of discussing its position regarding any matter within the scope of representation and its designated representative. 
Regarding agenda items, agenda items may be taken up out of order from those listed on the agenda you received today. Um, and I just made a note that it's a good practice to note that all times indicated and the orders of business are approximate and subject to change and the agenda reflects that. Regarding disclosure of documents, when writings which are otherwise public record are distributed to a majority of the members of the body for discussion or consideration at the public meeting, the writings must also be made available for public inspection. Generally, the records must be made available for inspection at the same time as they're distributed to members. When public records pertaining to an agenda item are prepared by the state body or a member of the state body and distributed to the state body members during a meeting, those documents must be made available for public inspection at the meeting. When the records are prepared by some other person and distributed to members of the state body during a meeting, those documents must be made available for public inspection after the meeting. Some records are exempt from disclosure under the Public Records Act, such as attorney-client privilege records. Those records need not be disclosed, even though the subject matter of those records may be considered or discussed at the meeting. A body may not charge a fee for the, a notice including the agenda of a meeting and may only charge those fees specifically authorized for public documents that are considered at the meeting. Documents distributed prior to or during the meeting that are public records must be made available upon request by a person with a disability in appropriate alternative formats. No extra charge can be imposed for putting those documents into an alternative format. And that concludes uh, the Bagley Keen overview. And uh, because I referenced uh, a similar guide to pair, prepared by the Department of Consumer Affairs, they've asked for, for credit for that. So I'm giving them credit here. Th thank you, Mark. Um, are, are there any questions of uh, Mark Sumner regarding Bagley Keen? If not, um, I'm going to introduce Carol Schwartzlander who is a staff person of the Department of Social Services, um, uh, who has been serving to staff the process to bring us to this point. Um, as you know, up until the actual establishment of the statewide authority, which is today, um, the Department of Social Services has essentially acted in its place regarding certain ministerial actions. So what I've asked uh, Carol to do is sort of give us a transition report on activities that um, have been underway or completed and are being transferred to the authority. Thank you. And I have to say, I wasn't expecting it, but Mark, I actually found the Bagley Keene presentation riveting. It was very good. Thank you for that. Um, go to the next slide, please. So I want to start by just talking about the infrastructure the state has developed to support the statewide authority initiative. We have two departments supporting the initiative, the California Department of Social Services, CDSS, and the California Department of Human Resources, CalHR. So CDSS is, oh, can you go back one, please? CDSS is responsible for the administrative and operation support for the IHSS statewide authority and the IHSS stakeholder advisory committee. And we'll be designating me as the administrative officer to support these activities. So we have the fun job of establishing the contracts, uh, developing the website. Um, we, we have a very modest website up right now, but we do continue to, uh, continue to grow it and develop it and enhance the website. The Department of Human Resources, upon delegation by the statewide authority, is going to serve as the, as the statewide authority's representative for the collective bargaining component. So prior to um, the MOUs and local agreements transitioning to the statewide authority, statute provided for a transition process. So the IHSS statewide authority has an opportunity to object to newly negotiated or amended non-economic terms of local MOUs. And the process that triggered, uh, the, the triggering process happened when CCI enrollment w commenced in a county. Go to the next. 
So until, as Will mentioned, until the statewide authority is operational, CDSS had that responsibility for objecting to the non-economic terms, and CDSS delegated collective bargaining authority for the, uh, the objections to CalHR. So to date, CDSS has issued timely objection notices to appropriate unions representing providers in five counties, San Mateo, Riverside, San Bernardino, San Diego, and Los Angeles. So the statewide authority will assume collective bargaining responsibility when the director of the Department of Healthcare Services issues that letter notifying that CCI enrollment is complete as she did, as Jennifer did for San Mateo County. Um, the other counties will roll in uh, on, a, on a staggered basis. And on the next slide, we have an anticipated MOU transition timeline. And I want to preface that, that it's for planning purposes and it's still contingent upon the letter being issued and enrollment being complete in each of the counties. But right now, this is the time frame that we're working with. Uh, as you know, February for San Mateo. In July, we expect Los Angeles, Riverside, San Bernardino, and San Diego to roll in. In January of 2016, Santa Clara. And in August of 2016, Orange County. Okay. Any questions? Thank you, Carol. Um, are there any questions of Carol on this item? If not, we will continue with our organizational items. Um, the, whoops, the next of which is to um, elect chair and vice chair. Uh, up to this point, I've simply been taking care of it in the form of the transition from CDSS to statewide authority. Um, the function, of course, of the chair is to both um, coordinate the meetings as well as to represent the statewide authority um, before any uh, state bodies and also to execute documents as required. Um, the function of the vice chair is to perform those duties when the chair is unavailable to do so. Um, at this point, I would ask if there are any nominations for chair and vice chair. Since your uh, debut has been uh, so successful uh, so far, uh, Will, I would nominate you for, uh, for chair and as, uh, as clearly the statewide uh, leader of expertise in the, the IHSS program. A second. It's been a motion and a second. Um, Carol, would you like to? Call the roll, please. Okay. Cohen? Aye. Kent? Aye. Lightborn? Aye. Powers? Aye. And if we could have a motion for the appointment of a vice chair. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to appoint the Director Kent as the uh, vice chair. Second. Uh, any discussion? If not, uh, please call the roll. Okay. Cohen? Kent? Aye. Lightborn? Aye. Powers? Aye. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to turn back to Mark Summers to um, review resolutions. Um, Actually, I think it's the bylaws. First. Yes, I'm sorry. The bylaws come first, then the resolutions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, we don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but I will go through a brief overview of the bylaws. Um, the members have them in your packets. There should also be a copy of the draft in the the packet that uh, audience members came up, and they're also available on the public website, as uh, Director Lightborn mentioned. The statewide authority is established pursuant to the government code, and it is established as a joint powers authority. It serves as the employer of record of individual IHSS providers for collective bargaining purposes only in those coordinated care initiative demonstration counties. The statewide authority is authorized to meet and confer in good faith regarding wages, benefits, and other terms and condition of employment with representatives of recognized employee organizations 
for any individual provider who is employed by a recipient of in-home supportive services. And as Director Lightborn mentioned, the statewide authority is considered a public entity separate and apart from the parties that had appointing power to the statewide authority and also separate from those employers of the individual so appointed. The statewide authority and the Department of Human Resources and other state departments may enter into memorandums of understandings or other agreements to have the Department of Human Resources on behalf of the statewide authority meet and confer and uh, undertake the negotiation process as Director Lightborn described. The statewide authority shall appoint an advisory committee known as the IHSS Stakeholder Advisory Committee and it shall be comprised of not more than 13 individuals. The authority shall designate a Department of Social Services employee to provide ongoing advice to support the advisory committee. And the statewide authority shall solicit recommendations for qualified members through a fair and open process such that members of the general public and interested persons and organizations can apply to be named members of that committee and we'll hear more information about that process later in the meeting. Uh, there are a few dis uh, disclaimers uh, and some of those I mentioned in the overview of Bagley Keene but just for the purposes of going through the bylaws uh, I'll repeat a couple of those. For the sole and limited purpose of collective bargaining the statewide authority will act as the employer of record regarding bargaining for wages and benefits and other terms and condition of employment for individual providers of in-home supportive services. The IHSS recipient shall be the employer of an individual provider with the unconditional and exclusive right to hire, fire, and supervise his or her provider. Any collective bargaining agreement between the statewide authority and any recognized employee organization shall not be binding but shall be presented in a jointly prepared written memorandum of understanding to the legislature for determination by a majority vote. The statewide authority shall not be responsible for paying wages and benefits to individual providers. The statewide authority shall not be the employer of record of individual providers of IHS who provide services pursuant to a county employed homemaker mode or contractor mode as authorized under the Welfare and Institutions Code. And the statewide authority shall not be the employer of record of individual providers who provide services under a cash and counseling model. And as we've discussed, the statewide authority consists of five members, two members are county officials who are appointed by the governor. Three members are the directors of the departments of social services, health care services, and finance, or their appointed representatives. The authority shall elect the chair and vice chair, and we just accomplished that. Uh, the terms of the chair and vice chair will be no longer than one year. The chair will be the executive head. The vice chair serves as chair in the absence of the chair or when a motion involving the chair is being discussed. The statewide authority may appoint an administrative officer and we'll get to that later in the meeting. The administrative officer shall manage the operations of the authority, coordinate communications, provide support to the advisory committee and then perform all duties delegated by the statewide authority. In terms of meetings, uh, all meetings except those closed sessions that are otherwise permitted by law shall be open and public and conform to the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act. This is just another way of incorporating that California law about open meetings that I referenced earlier into the actual bylaws of the statewide authority. And as I mentioned, certain proceedings are exempt from the Open Meeting Act and I discussed those earlier so I, I won't repeat myself. Uh, the rest of that article, Article 8, 
discusses those provisions of the Open Meeting Act that I referenced before. And uh, just to make uh, an extra mention that there is provision under the Open Meeting Act for special meetings uh, in case the 10 day notice requirement would be an undue or substantial hardship for the statewide authority or if immediate action is required to protect the public interest. Under Article 9, which is uh, the quorum section, there need to be at least three appointed voting members of the statewide authority to constitute a quorum and to have an official meeting. And then the authority may only act upon affirmative vote of at least three of the members. And Article 10 references Robert's Rules of Order that I mentioned in the, my presentation earlier. Article 11 references the Advisory Committee, which we'll also hear about later in the meeting. The Advisory Committee shall provide ongoing advice and recommendations regarding the IHSS program to the statewide authority. No less than 50% of the Advisory Committee members shall be individuals who are current or past users of personal assistance services paid for through public or private funds or recipients of IHSS. At least two members of the committee shall be current or former providers of in-home supportive services. Individuals who represent organizations that advocate for people with disabilities or seniors may be appointed to the committee and individuals from each representative organization that are designated representatives of individual providers shall be appointed to the advisory committee. The initial term of each of those members of the advisory committee shall be for one or two years as determined by the statewide authority to allow for staggered terms. Those incumbent, incumbents, excuse me, may be appointed to one additional two year successive terms and the members serve at the discretion of the statewide authority. Article 12 discusses the statewide authority's conduct of business. Um, the bylaws confer signature authority to the administrative officer or his or her designee for the purposes of executing contracts and other legal documents. Contracts valued at $50,000 or less, uh, the administrative officer is delegated authority to enter into those or amend those contracts for contracts over $50,000, the statewide authority must first authorize the expenditure. Then the authority can, des can delegate to the administrative officer the authority to award and enter those contracts subject to other state rules, including state administrative manual. And for contracts of $10,000 or less, the authority authorizes the administrative officer to delegate authority to a designee to enter into or amend contracts for the sole purpose of procurement of goods, equipment, administrative and consulting service agreements, or other agreements necessary to carry out administrative operations. And the statewide authority delegates to the administrative officer the authority to establish administrative policy to ensure compliance with other federal and state laws, regulations and policies governing government operations. Article 13 discusses the authority of the statewide, uh, the authority, excuse me, of the statewide authority and those conditions under which it, the statewide authority's authority could be terminated. That could happen if the coordinated care initiative becomes inoperative, except uh, in a couple instances First, where an agreement that has been negotiated and approved by the statewide authority, then the statewide authority will continue to retain its authority uh, until the agreement expires or is subject to renegotiation, whereby the authority shall terminate and the county shall become the employer of record. In the second instance, when an agreement has been assumed by the statewide authority, but was negotiated and approved by a predecessor agency, the statewide authority shall cease being the employer of record and the county shall be reestablished as the employer of record for purposes of collective bargaining. In the last article, Article 14 just discusses amendments that 
the bylaws may be amended or repealed uh, subject to a vote by the statewide authority members uh, in accordance with Article 9, and that just means an, a majority vote. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, do authority members have any questions of Mark regarding the bylaws? Um, Jennifer. So um, I have two questions. The first one you mentioned in the Bagley Keene overview that um, to the extent that there was significant public comment on, a, on an agenda item that we as the authority could limit public comment to a certain time period to allow for all interested parties to speak. Would we have to put that into the bylaws today? Because I don't see it in here where we could either limit the time at, the, at that meeting or do we have to have something already in the bylaws if we were going to do that? We don't have to have a rule specified in the bylaws. Typically, what can happen is the chair of a meeting can announce at the beginning of a meeting if there are going to be limits on discussion for a particular agenda item or time limits on a particular comment. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my second question is, in delegating the authority to the administrative officer for the execution of contracts, if there's something that we could maybe have where the authority receives um, any kind of contract um, activity in the subsequent meetings so that there's a transparency from the standpoint of all contracts, regardless of whether they fall under the dollar threshold, just for purposes of making sure that we're aware of contracts that have been entered into. That that's, that's, a that's a good uh, suggestion, and we'll, uh, we'll have to incorporate that in the bylaws. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the authority? If not, this is an opportunity for the public, first the public who is here and then the public on the phone, if there are any questions or comments regarding uh, the bylaws. Let me start with um, those in the room and I'd ask people to identify themselves when they comment and to limit themselves to two minutes. Thanks. Seeing no one in the room, operator, is there anyone on the telephone who's seeking to comment or ask a question? Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question or post a comment, please press star then one on your touchtone phone. You may remove yourself from the queue at any time by pressing the star key followed by the digit two. If you're using speakerphone, please pick up the handset before pressing the corresponding digits. Once again, press star one at this time and we do have questions on the line. Our first question comes from Joe Riley at IHSS San Diego. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm uh, curious about the uh, whether it's going to be 58 counties that are going to be collectively bargained for, and are they all going to have the same wage and uh, um, benefit? For so it's equity for all those counties, or is it going to be 58 different bargaining or MOUs or whatever it is? And also one other question. Uh, there was the um, HSS recipients have rights as an employer, which is to hire and fire, I believe you said, but uh, there's also, I guess, in, in statute that they have the right to train and supervise, but you didn't mention those, and I wondered why. Joey, uh, this is Will Lightborn. I'll, I'll sort of start with a response to your uh, question or concern. Um, only seven counties are going to transition under the Coordinated Care Initiative um, to collective bargaining with the statewide authority. Um, the remaining 51 counties um, are not currently scheduled as part of CCI. Um, the legislature may in the future decide to add other counties to CCI, but that's not currently anticipated. Um, in terms of the bargaining process, that has yet to be determined whether contracts are being negotiated in any sort of grouped fashion or they're being uh, negotiated individually. Um, that, that, that will sort of be d decisions to come in consultation with our bargaining representatives. Um, in terms of the issue of the authority of the IHSS recipient or consumer regarding their provider, um, the bylaws do specify that the recipient can hire, fire, and supervise their uh, provider of service. Okay, and also I have one other comment. There, there's the uh, phone lines are 
uh, kind of cutting out. It's very hard to hear people. Uh, I don't know if you can do anything about that. And also, what if the CCI uh, initiative, the Coordinated Care Initiative, goes, uh, uh, you know, where people opt out and it's no longer viable, uh, then would the statewide authority also not be viable also? Uh, Joey, uh, again, will Lightborn to respond? The um, bylaws provide that in the event that the Coordinated Care Initiative um, ends or is discontinued, then the statewide authority function would also wind down, although with a process for transitioning contracts back to counties, depending upon whether they had been contracts uh, negotiated under the statewide authority or they had been contracts that the statewide authority had assumed or inherited um, from the counties. Next question. And our next question comes from Craig Yates. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Craig Yates. I live here in San Rafael, California. And I was wondering, what, um, what are those seven counties that are in, involved? Um, the seven counties are uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, Riverside, San Bernardino, Orange, and Santa Clara. And San Mateo. Okay. And will you be able to uh, get Marin County involved? Marin County is not currently scheduled to become a CCI county. The counties that were selected for the initiative were done so as, uh, by an act of the legislature. So it would take an act of the legislature to add additional counties. So that would be something to contact our appropriate representatives to enforce or bring about? Yes, either Assembly or State Senate. Okay. And in regards to the unions of representation for the caregivers that are involved with IHSS, have they entertained the idea of Teamsters, Teamster Union? Um, the, the representation of the IHSS providers in the S Coordinated Care Initiative counties are both the United Domestic Workers affiliated with um, American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees and uh, several different uh, locals of the Service Employees International Union. Next so question. How would entertain the idea of getting Teamsters? It would be up to the providers themselves to determine uh, bargaining representation. Okay. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Is there another question, operator? We do have another question on the line from Christine Loomis at IHSS. Hi. I I'm actually Christine Loomis from Riverside, a consumer of IHSS services. And I just had one quick comment that right now as questions are being answered, we can hear well on the phone, but during the meeting when the speakers are speaking, it is fading in and out and, and impossible to hear at times and a medium at other times. So perhaps it's direction of microphone or whatever. I just wanted to make it a little more accessible for those of us on the phone if possible. Thank My only question. Right. Thank you for letting us know, and I'll ask my colleagues and um, our, our, our staff and attorneys to speak directly into the microphones. Yeah, uh, that could be all it takes. Thank you very much. My only question is um, regarding uh, consumer or recipient representation. Normally when we bargain within our counties, we have bargaining committees that do have um, both providers and consumers at the table. And we also have, of course, advisory committees within the county where consumers of IHSS have a voice. Uh, and I'm wondering, with statewide bargaining, how you hope to integrate us? At this point, I don't believe there has been a discussion as to um, integration. The st statewide IHSS Advisory Committee, however, is anticipated to provide input to both the statewide authority and to the Departments of Social Services and Healthcare Services on all areas of operation of the IHSS program. 
so that would be the equivalent to the county advisory committees on a statewide level but it would not be direct access to bargaining input that's correct uh, I'd just like to comment that I think it would be good if uh, consumers had a voice in the bargaining because it is our lives that are at stake. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there are no further questions in the queue at this time. Thank you. Are there any uh, queries on the web? No? If not, then it's back before the statewide authority. Um, is there a motion to adopt the bylaws? I would so move with the amendment that uh, Jennifer made in terms of bringing all contracts uh, back at the uh, next available uh, authority meeting. Second. If there's no further discussion, uh, would you call the roll? Cohen. Aye. Kent. Aye. Lightborn. Aye. Powers. Aye. Thank you. Um, now, having gotten back on schedule and on track, I was going to ask Mark uh, Sumner to review the resolutions. We have three other resolutions. Pardon? Are three other ministerial resolutions uh, that I mentioned briefly in the bylaws. Uh, the first you'll find in your packet is resolution number 2015-3 in the matter of the appointment of the, um, I'm sorry, that's for the, yeah, in the matter of the appointment of the administrative officer. They're not in the packets. We're oh. just going to review them. Okay. Let me just note, they're not in the packets, but the resolutions, once they're signed, will be posted on the website. Okay. Thanks, Carol. Uh, so I'll read the text of the resolutions. They're not long. In the matter of the appointment of the Administrative Officer for the California In-Home Supportive Services Authority, the statewide authority hereby resolves that Carol Schwartzlander is appointed to serve as the Administrative Officer to the statewide authority. The Administrative Officer is also designated to provide ongoing advice and support to the Stakeholder Advisory Committee. I think we're going to take all three resolutions together and all right. discuss them. The second resolution is 2015-4 in the manner of a formal agreement between the Statewide Authority and the California Department of Human Resources. The Statewide Authority hereby approves the execution of a Memorandum of Understanding between the Statewide Authority and California Department of Human Resources for the purposes of delegating to the Department Authority to perform collective bargaining pursuant to the Welfare and Institutions Code, Section 12300.5, on behalf of the Statewide Authority and other tasks to support the Statewide Authority and the implementation of the In-Home Supportive Services Employer-Employee Relations Act. And the third and final resolution is 2015-5 in the matter of a formal agreement between the California In-Home Supportive Services Statewide Authority and the California Department of Social Services. The Statewide Authority hereby approves the execution of an interagency agreement between the Statewide Authority and the Department of Social Services pursuant to the Welfare and Institutions Code to specify services and authorize funds necessary to support the functions and activities of the statewide authority and the stakeholder advisory committee. Thank you, Mark. Um, do any authority members have any questions about the resolutions? If not, is th there is opportunity for public comment? Again, please identify yourselves and limit comment or questions to two minutes. Let me start with those in the room. Seeing no one offering comment or question. Um, operator, are there any comments or questions on the telephone? We have a follow-up from Craig Yates. Thank you. Uh, yes, Craig Yates again. Um, 
in regards to all the information that you're sharing here, is there a way we can get hard copies of that information? Um, the, well, let me turn to Carol. The, the resolutions will be posted online under the IHSS Statewide Authority website. Okay, and also the minutes of today's meetings? Yes, it'll be posted as well. Okay, and so all the information pertaining to today's meetings all follow under the, uh, all the actions will follow under the Brown Act? Um, not the Brown Act, it's bagley Keene Act, which is the state level version, if you will, of the Brown Act, which is local government. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions on the telephone? Not at this time. Are there any questions on the um, web portal? If not, let's bring the matter back before the authority. Um, can we have a motion to approve the resolutions? So moved. Second. Carol? Okay, Cohen? Aye. Kent? Aye. Lightborn? Aye. Powers? Aye. The next item of business we want to cover is the structure and process for creating the IHSS Stakeholder Advisory Committee that was just referred to in, a, in dialogue with one of our callers. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll ask Carol Schwartzlander to uh, walk us through the proposed approach. Sure. So a copy of the draft Stakeholder Advisory Committee application is included in your packets, and it's also posted on the website if you'd like to follow along. So the statewide authority is responsible for appointing a 13-member stakeholder advisory committee for the purpose of providing ongoing advice and recommendations regarding the IHSS program to the statewide authority, to the Department of Social Services, and to the Department of Healthcare Services. It's important to note, as Will did earlier, that the stakeholder advisory committee will not be providing input on any matters related to collective bargaining. It's going to be focused on program. And it's also important to notice that the solicitation for members is statewide. It is not limited to CCI counties. So I'll say that again. It's statewide, not limited to CCI counties. So anyone from across the state can apply. As Mark reviewed, the composition of the committee is defined in statute. Uh, at least 50% of the members must be current or past users of personal assistance services paid for through public or private funds or be recipients of IHSS. At least two of the members must be either a current or former provider of IHSS. Statute allows for union representatives from each representative organization of designated representatives of IHSS providers. And then statute also allows for individuals who advocate for persons with disabilities or older adults may be part of the advisory committee. While that provision is um, permissive, we're hopeful to have some advocate representation as well. Um, Mark also reviewed the term of office, but again, the term of the office is one or two years as determined by the statewide authority to allow for staggered terms. Members may be appointed for one additional two-year consecutive term. The expectation of the members is outlined on page four of the application under membership agreement. Members must attend at least one meeting per year and other meetings as necessary. They need to actively participate in every convened meeting they need to prepare for each meeting by reading the materials uh, distributed in advance. They're expected to engage in small and large group discussion in a manner that's respectful of the different opinions that come to the table. They'll work together to achieve consistent consensus on recommendations to the statewide authority. Uh, they'll gather local community and or affiliated group input regarding any matters or priorities for consideration by the advisory committee. And they're expected to facilitate communication between the stakeholder advisory committee and their community representatives. The timeline for application, um, we're going to we're going to finalize the application and release a formal solicitation by March 6th. We hope to have a fillable application posted online on the statewide authority website. Applications will be due on May 1st. They must be signed and they must either be received or postmarked by May 1st to be considered. Um, you can submit applications by email, fax, or um, regular mail. We expect the statewide authority to take action on appointing the stakeholder advisory committee at the next scheduled meeting of the statewide authority.
Thank you, Carol. Are there any questions from authority members regarding the process of um, creating the statewide advisory committee? Just a quick question. The notice will be posted online. Any, anywhere else, any other notification process? Or? We'll be utilizing the Department of Social Services notification process. We have an IHSS stake, stakeholder list. It'll oh, go out through there and also be posted online. Great. Thank you. And same for Department of Healthcare Services. We have a large stakeholder list, and we can send it out through our list as well. Any other uh, questions or comments from authority members? If not, um, it's an opportunity again for public um, comment or participation. Um, there is a speaker in the room. And that is star one by phone again. And on the, if we could hold the phone questions for a moment, because we do have one speaker in the room. Hi, I'm Brandi Wolf. I'm with United Long-Term Care Workers Local of SEIU. I just have a question on the makeup of the advisory committee. Um, it's Article 11.2.3, um, individuals from each representative organization. I just want to clarify. So there's five home care locals that represent IHSS providers, three of which are under SEIU, UDW is under AFSME, and then CU is a, a joint local. Is that one from each of the five or one from SEIU, one from AFSME? I just it, want to clarify. It was anticipated as one from SEIU, one from AFSME, and potentially one from CU. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Operator, do we have any questions or comments on the telephone? We do have a follow-up from Joe Riley at IHSS San Diego. Yes, in choosing the advisory members, uh, who chooses them? And when, you, when it's uh, of each of the uh, uh, five uh, unions, is, is there a way a provider who's not in the union uh, that may be on advanced pay could be on the advisory committee? Thank you, Joey. Uh, this, this is Will. Um, the statewide authority, the, the five constituted members, are responsible for appointing the advisory committee, um, and that will be done in an open meeting. Um, the representation via the unions is, of course, one assumes for the represented members. However, it also, the makeup of the stakeholder advisory, statewide advisory committee also includes uh, two people who are or have been providers. So that may be an opportunity for someone who is providing services under IHSS but is not represented to be included on the advisory committee. Are there any other questions on the line operator? Not at this time, sir. Thank you. Um, so we want to adopt the process as being that of the statewide authority. Um, if there's no further comment, can we have a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. Should I roll? Cohen? Aye. Kent? Aye. Lightborn? Aye. Powers? Aye. Thank you. The next meeting for the statewide authority has been scheduled for August 6th, um, 1 p.m., to take place again in, in this room. Um, we. Oh, just a correction. It's, it's going to be located in this building, but the room next door. The, I am corrected, the room next door. Um, and um, I would look to both members of the authority and anyone in the public who would like to suggest agenda items for that meeting. Hearing none from the authority members, is there anyone in the room who has suggested agenda items? Operator, is there anyone on the phone Wishing to speak? I do have a comment on the phone from Christine Loomis. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. This is Christine Loomis from Riverside again, commenting as an IHSS consumer or recipient. And uh, my comment or question really relates to the accessibility 
of these meetings to consumers if you uh, are having representation from consumers is it possible for them to participate like today by phone rather than traveling to Sacramento since that's very difficult for many of us yes the all of our meetings will um, be both uh, have, have telephone call-in uh, capacity as today does as well as be webcast with the materials posted so that if someone is following along by computer um, they can see the materials that are available to the, to the uh, statewide authority. And, and what about for the advisory committee? For the, just the, 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 the advisory committees will definitely have um, call-in capacity and will endeavor to get um, webcast capacity. Right. Thank you. Um, those take place, I presume, in Sacramento as well, the advisory committee meetings. I, th that's not something that's been sort of considered or discussed yet. Um, as a suggestion, I think once the um, advisory committee is established, I, I think certainly as one member of the authority, I'd be inclined to look to them for, to help us determine what, what's the most convenient and accessible way for them to do business. All right. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And we have another comment from Joe Riley. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, as far as agenda items that you're looking for, um, I uh, ha am an admin for a Facebook site called the IHSS uh, Consumers, Providers, and Advocates United. Uh, there's over there's about 1,900 pe people on that of consumers and providers mainly uh, of IHSS. Uh, and what I'm finding is that a lot of providers are being told by their social workers uh, that, for example, if they're uh, a parent provider, they're not entitled to workers' compensation. Or um, in counties, they tell people, we don't do advanced pay. So there's a lot of counties that are giving people, and these are admin and supervisors of social workers, that are giving people misinformation, and they don't actually understand. So I'm, I'm hoping that that could be on the agenda item to actually uh, clarify to counties, uh, you know, what providers' rights are and uh, what benefits they're entitled to, because uh, even if they get a piece of paper, uh, if the social worker, when they, because the way that a, a provider, when they're injured on the job, would access the social worker, if the social worker says, no, you're not entitled to workers' compensation, uh, then they pay for it out of pocket. So I'm hoping that we can remedy some of the um, woes of IHSS. Uh, Joey, um I think that the, the sort of issue that you're raising is one that certainly the statewide advisory committee um, should be considering items like that. Um, those would probably be referred, though, not to the statewide authority um, because the statewide authority is not going to be responsible for administering the actual IHSS program itself, but instead for collective bargaining. Instead, the statewide advisory committee would uh, make those sorts of concerns or suggestions or input known either to the Department of Social Services or the Department of Healthcare Services or both. Um, and in the specific instance you just raised, Eileen Carroll, who is the Deputy Director for Adult Programs at Social Services, was writing down the issue as you were speaking. So I suspect Eileen will follow up directly with you um, uh, in the next couple of days. Well, as far as, uh, you know, what the statewide authority deals with, maybe uh, this would be a suggestion for an agenda item, is to collect data on the uh, counties and what the, uh, uh, you know, what the makeup is of providers, what the uh, cost of living in that particular county, what would warrant, uh, you know, a higher pay, that kind of thing. Uh, because it just seems like it's not, it's not, um, has any rhyme or reason to, you know, um, 
uh, where you live, what the cost of living, or even the services that you're doing, like if you are doing just domestic services like house cleaning compared to highly skilled uh, paramedical services uh, where you're doing, uh, you know, uh, uh, sterile procedures and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, would warrant maybe a uh, tier of uh, a different pay rate or maybe even seniority. Those kind of issues uh, have, I don't think, been really addressed. And just speaking for myself, uh, and I invite any other authority members who, who want to comment, um, those sorts of issues would be subject to collective bargaining. Um, and the, the sort of data that you're describing, uh, collecting, um, would be sort of germane supporting information for the collective bargaining process. So, so that is um, information that, that would be consistent. And um, when we convene at the August meeting, um, I, I anticipate we will um, definitely have on the agenda uh, information about where we are um, process-wise in terms of s setting expectations and um, having a sense of what costs versus wages and benefits look like. Operator, are there, are there any other callers? We do have a comment or question from Janet Clark at CICA. Yes, this is Janet Clark from SICA. I was wondering if on the, the advisory committee, if there's any consideration given for people that are in the 28 rural counties to be on this uh, committee. Yes, um, people from all 58 counties are eligible. Um, and again, not to speak for the, all the other authority members, when we are considering the appointment process, I'm sure there will be an issue of distribution, representation of, of the, the various parts of our state. Thank you. And there are no further questions in the queue at this time. And there's none on the web. With that, we've completed the agenda for this meeting. Um, I'd like to thank everyone, both who attended, those who are um, with us on the telephone. I'd particularly like to thank the staff of Cali PA, Andrea, um, and others who have sort of carried our process today and made it really so smooth and um, uh, uh, easy to access. And I'd like to thank uh, Carol Schwartzlander for all the work she has done to, to get us to this point. Do um, any other authority members have any concluding comments? Uh, just uh, thank you, Chair Lightborn. I, I would just uh, echo your comments that you made over the, during that last item in terms of uh, access, accessibility during the uh, stakeholder meeting, both in terms of geographic locations, in terms of different types of uh, communication, like we had the internet here today or, or Skype or who knows, whatever. We want to be flexible as to whatever works for them. Uh, and the type of data that you mentioned, that would be very helpful for us to hear from them. So, so thank you. Thank you all very much. We are concluded. Uh, uh, Motion to adjourn. Second. It's always in order. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>